All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is Zahid Pashi. Uh, I was discussing uh, the regression assumptions. In my previous session, I have discussed the normality and linearity uh, as the first two assumptions of regression analysis. So today, I am going to discuss the remaining assumptions of regression uh, using SPSS. The third assumption is basically uh, the independence of error or in independence of residue as an important assumption for regression analysis. The residue uh, means the difference between observed and predicted value. Observed values means the values that we have collected. The data that we have collected is basically the observed value. Predicted values means the estimated values that we have estimated from the software or we have predicted from the software. So uh, the residue or the error are basically the difference between what we have collected and what we have predicted. So uh, the residue should be independent of each other. They should not depend in each other. Uh, so one error term or one residual term should not be depending on the previous or the next or the similar error term. So in survey data, uh, this implies that the responses from different participants should not be correlated. If the responses from one participant is correlated with the responses with the other participant, it means uh, the, uh, the, the, the error terms are dependent they are not independent so in other words the error associated with one observation should not be systematically related to the error of the other observation so uh, graphically uh, your map would look like this if your map of the residues of predicted values and uh, standardized values uh, will look like this it means there is there is an uh, there is an error of dependency or there is there is the dependency of residual uh, so the error of one observation should not be systematically related to the error of the other observation so how to analyze the independence of error or residual uh, in order uh, to analyze the independence of error or residuals we need to go to analyze, then regression, then linear. Select your dependent variable, your independent variable. Click OK to run the analysis. Save the residuals in linear regression dialog box. Go to save uh, but, uh, button. Check the unstandardized and standardized residuals. Click continue and then click OK to run the analysis. Create residual plots. Go to graph legacy dialog box scatter dot choose simple scatter and click define. Uh, select your independent variable on the x axis and residual on the y axis. Click OK to generate the scatter plot. Now we will follow this procedure. We go to uh, our example data that we were previously following. For example, uh, this is the data that I have shared with you, example one data, for example, uh, we are going to use again for explaining this procedure that we are, we were already following. Uh, so uh, in between the data is open, uh, let us discuss the procedure that we were previously discussing. So let me open it. All right, the data is basically open here. First of all, we need to see the data. Uh, the dependent variable was basically the total marks and the independent variable was GPF. So uh, as a procedure, we go to analyze, we go to regression, linear, and then we consider our dependent variable, which is total marks and our independent variable, which is PPA. Then what is the next thing that we need to do? We go to the procedure 
save residues. We go to save residue and check the unstandardized and standardized residue as a second procedure. So we go to save button. We check the unstandardized and standardized residue and click continue. Then after that, what we need to do, we go to create plot, go to graph legacy dialog box, scatter dot. Uh, all right. So let's run the procedure first. So click on OK. After doing this, we go to graph. We go to legacy dialog box. And from here, what we need to do, uh, we need to select the scatter dot. So go to graph, go to legacy dialog box and check the scatter dot. Now this option that we need to choose, select the simple scatter, click define. And we need to put, uh, what we need to put here, uh, here we need to put the uh, independent variable on x-axis and residual on the y-axis. So, uh, in that case, our independent variable is basically the GPA. The GPA is independent variable. We need to put it on x-axis and we need to put the residue. Uh, you can choose either unstandardized residue or standardized residue. For example, if we choose standardized residue, uh, we put it on y-axis and then we need to click on OK and it will generate the required graph. Now the graph look like this. And if you compare it uh, with the similar graph here uh, that we have discussed, uh, for example, this one, it looks like similar look like this, but we cannot decide whether uh, this is basically showing the independence of uh, the residual or not. So there is there is uh, an examination that we need to consider here. So examine the scatter plot to check for any pattern or trend in the residue. Look for a random scatter of points around the horizontal axis. Pattern or trend may indicate violation of the assumption. So this is the procedure that we have followed here uh, like this. We have followed all these procedures like this we have created residues we have followed the scatter diagram we have created like this standardized residue and it shows us this graph now uh, if you see this graph is basically uh, does not indicating any pattern or relationship it is not showing either the increasing or decreasing relationship. So we can say that uh, the independence of uh, residual is violated here. The assumption is that the uh, residual of residuals, uh, residuals uh, of uh, uh, residuals are not independent here because it is not showing any pattern. So you can see here, this is the reference line. And this line is horizontal line. So the, the, the predicted line is not showing any uh, of a pattern. And we can generate this line if you go to your graph. You just need to double click on it. And it will show you the graph like this. You need to create your reference line first. It will show you a reference line. But this line does not indicate any uh, prediction, then you need to create a fit line here. So uh, the fit line is basically horizontal. It means there is no uh, any, uh, you can say particular direction uh, could be found here. The direction is horizontal. So we can say that uh, the uh, assumption of uh, independence of uh, residual is violated here. But if it shows any direction, like the upper direction or lower direction, then we can say that the independence of residual is not violated. So here we conclude that independence of 
uh, residual is violated here. So uh, what we need to do, uh, there is non-graphical method here in order to test uh, if, if you could not verify whether the independence of uh, residual is violated or not. If, if you cannot decide from this start, there is one better method that you can use uh, for understanding exactly in terms of some uh, concrete value uh, that this assumption is violated or not. So uh, there is a test which is known as Durban-Watson uh, test. It is an optional test which you can analyze uh, in order to verify whether the independence of residual is violated or not. So if you want a formal statistical test for autocorrelation, you can use the Durban-Watson statistics. So in, in order to apply this test, you go to analyze regression linear, put your DV and IV in the relevant box and click on statistics button. Check Durban Watson statistic in the residual box and click continue and click OK. Now, this non-graphical procedure uh, will be followed using the same uh, method that we are following in order to check the regression result. Uh, you, you, you just need to go to the statistics option and you need to check the uh, Durban Watson here uh, in order to verify your results. So uh, your value, if it is a value close to two indicates that residual are independent. A value less than one or greater than three indicates residual are not independent. So this is the criteria that we need to verify from here. So we go to analyze. We go to regression. Analyze. Regression linear, DV and IV, and always remember that you need to uncheck the other option from the save button and go to statistics and check the Durban Watson statistic. It, it, it will show you the concrete results. If the Durban Watson statistic is close to two, it means uh, your uh, independence of uh, independence of residual is not being violated. So if this value, if this Durban Watson value is uh, close to one or greater than three, if it is uh, less than two, uh, for example, it is it is close to one or close to three or greater than three, then we can say that our our assumption of independence of error is being violated. So uh, non-graphical procedure confirms that independence of uh, residual is not being violated here. Uh, so we can conclude that here the assumption uh, that independence of error is not being violated. So a value less than one or greater than three indicates that uh, 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 independence of error is not being violated. A value close to two indicate that residues are independent. So this this is the uh, basic criteria. Uh, next is the assumption. The assumption number four is multipollinearity between IVs. How to consider the multipollinearity between independent variables? So the independent variables should not be perfectly correlated with each other. High level of multicollinearity can lead to unstable coefficient estimate and can make it difficult to determine the individual contribution of each independent variable. So multicollinearity exists when independent variable are correlated. Correlated independent variable make it difficult to make inference about the individual regression coefficient and their individual effect on the dependent variable. SPSS provides collinearity diagnostic, including variance inflation factor values. High VIF values suggest multicollinearity. So there is a criteria. There are uh, the sources of multicollinearity includes 
a large number of IVs and low degree of freedom, common trends of IV, model misspecification, inclusion of some irrelevant independent variable in the model. Uh, there are many, many uh, consequences. There are many sources and there are some theoretical uh, consequences of multicollinearity. A large sample is needed if uh, uh, multicollinearity is present. However, in some cases, the sample cannot be enhanced due to time and cost constraint. Uh, it is a sample phenomena. Multicollinearity is sample phenomena. It is not in the case of entire population, usually found in non-experimental data like GDP and its determinants. It is data deficiency problem. A simple interpretation of coefficient may not be valid. We can we, we need to provide special interpretation in case multicollinearity exists and we cannot eliminate it due to any constraint. OLS estimator remain to be unbiased, no violation of blue property. Blue means best linear unbiased estimator. So this is, these are the theoretical consequences when uh, multicollinearity exists. But there are some practical consequences. Uh, for example, wrong signs of coefficient. Your coefficient may not be uh, as per hypothesis, as per uh, expected signs, as per theories. Uh, the p-values may be low and R-square may be high. Uh, low t-value due to high standard error. Uh, the model may be unstable. Uh, you, you, you need to verify the call-in method here. Uh, individual variable were not significant, but the model seems to be statistically fit. So what are the methods to detect the multicollinearity using SPSS? There are two methods. The first method is correlation coefficient method. Uh, you need to verify uh, the uh, uh, wh wh whether the correlation between independent variable is highly significant or not. And there is another method which is used uh, as uh, uh, VIF method using linear regression analysis. So uh, we need to verify how we can uh, check the multicollinearity. The first method using correlation includes uh, go to analyze, go to correlate, and then bivariate correlations. And using this method, you need to uh, consider all of your independent variable here and uh, check the Pearson correlation option as a correlation coefficient here. Uh, two uh, test of significance as a two tail. And uh, here, you need to identify uh, the correlation value, which is greater than 0.75, uh, along with their significance. When there is not a significance correlation, then it does not matter how high, how high or how low the correlation coefficient is. However, if there is a significant correlation, it means the correlation coefficient p value is less than 0.05, between two IVs, you need to check its correlation coefficient. If if the significant correlations show the coefficient value greater than 0.75, it is called a uh, perfect multicollinearity, and it would be considered as a uh, multicollinearity issue. And if uh, the significant correlation indicates uh, a coefficient value less than 0 0.75, it is known as imperfect multicollinearity and it may not be the cause of multicollinearity here. So uh, let's suppose we need to consider this procedure. So how can we verify the correlation procedure in order to test the multicollinearity issue here? So go to analyze, go to uh, correlate by variate and you need to check your independent variable for example gpa was the independent variable let's suppose uh, total marks and percentage marks are also independent variable we need to verify pearson correlation is checked here and test of significance to tail click on ok first of all you need to check uh, that uh, the p-value should be less than 5%. So 
So if you see here, the P value is less than 5%, but the correlation coefficient value is less than 0.75. So we can say that there is no multicollinearity issue between total marks and percentage marks. But if you see here, uh, there is a correlation between uh, total marks and percentage marks here because the correlation coefficient is greater than 0.75 and significance value is showing uh, a p value. There was an interruption of internet. So I was discussing that there is a multicollinearity issue between total marks and percentage marks here. So because the correlation coefficient is greater than 0.75, and p value is significant so if the p value is significant and correlation coefficient greater than 0.75 it means there is a multicollinearity issue here there is another method that is very useful in case of uh, uh, basically uh, this method that is collinearity diagnostic method or vif method so uh, you, you, you need to follow the same procedure. You go to analyze, you go to regression. This time you need to choose the regression, go to linear. Uh, for example, uh, total is your dependent variable and percentage marks is the independent variable here. Uh, while the total is dependent variable and final marks are also as an independent variable. For example, these three are my independent variable. Now, uh, now I go to statistics and from here, uncheck the Durban-Watson, but check the collinearity diagnostic here. Now click on continue, click on OK. Uh, you need to see the VIF values here. Uh, the one with highest VIF value or you can say if the VIF value is greater than 5, it indi indicates the collinearity issue here. So you can say here that the collinearity may be arise due to final marks because the VIF value is very high. VIF value here is greater than 5. So this is this is basically the issue uh, there is an issue with the uh, collinearity uh, uh, due to final marks. Uh, you can further verify here uh, using the, uh, you, you can say the variance proportion. If you can see here, the variance proportion in case of uh, final marks and percentage marks are very high, 0 0.87 and 0 0.97. So it indicates that there is a high multicollinearity issue between percentage marks and final marks because their proportion is very high. Uh, so uh, what, does, what are the remedies if, if we find out the high proportion of percentage marks? There is, a, there is a guideline that you need to understand here. There is a guideline when we need to understand the collinearity statistics. So check the VIF and tolerance under collinearity statistics in the table coefficient. If VIF value less than 10 and tolerance is greater than 0 0.10 for all the IVs, there is no multicollinearity issue. If VIF greater than 10 and tolerance is less than 0 0.10 in two IVs only, it assumes that multicollinearity exists only in, in in those two IVs and does not need to interpret the collinearity diagnostic. In our case, if we see here, in our case, the VIF value is less than 10. It is basically moderate uh, uh, multicollinearity issue because this value is less than 10. Uh, if it is greater than 5 but less than 10, it is known as uh, basically the moderate multicollinearity. So uh, the guideline says that it is not a problem, but if this value is greater than 10, then it is a problem. So in case, if you find VIF value greater than 10, then you need to see the collinearity diagnostic table that I have read now. So 
if VIF greater than 10 is found in more than two IVs, then look at the collinearity diagnostic. Identify the row in eigenvalue column with value close to zero. Identify the row in uh, condition index column with value greater than 15. Identify the row in variance proportion in more than one column with value greater than 0 0.90. So this is, these are the guidelines. If a variance proportion value greater than 0 0.90 is found between two or more IVs, this is the real issue of multicollinearity. If a variance proportion value greater than 0 0.90 is found for one IV, this is not an issue. So always remember that first of all, you need to verify if your VIF value is greater than 10 or not. So in our case, the VIF value is not greater than 10. Therefore, we cannot proceed, uh, proceed with the collinearity issue in the collinearity diagnostic table. So what is next? This is basically the remedies in case if you found uh, some multicollinearity issue. So what is mild multicollinearity? If you find multicollinearity uh, or VIF value less than 10, it means there is mild multicollinearity. In that case, you don't need to do anything. Uh, but if you find perfect multicollinearity, it means if you find a multicollinearity uh, with a VIF value greater than 10, then the first thing that you need to do is you try to increase your sample size. It means if your number of observation are, for example, 300, try to increase uh, the number of observation by 50 or by 100. Uh, maybe your multicollinearity would be removed. If you find perfect multicollinearity uh, and if the forecasting is only required, then you do not need to do anything. If you found perfect multicollinearity, if sample size cannot be increased due to time and cost, do nothing. If you find perfect multicollinearity, it is not a problem if theory permit us to estimate the missing coefficient. So do nothing but drop one of the IV causing multicollinearity. So if you find multicollinearity between two independent variables, it means uh, both of the independent variables are showing high VIF value then you need to drop one of the independent variable. If you find perfect multicollinearity, uh, drop the less in, uh, significant, drop the one with larger VIF. Do not drop the variable if the theory make this variable compulsory. Then if you find multicollinearity, you can also transpose uh, one of your variable. For example, if you find multicollinearity between two variables like import export you can make a combined variable like openness if you found uh, uh, multicollinearity between import and export you can subtract uh, export from import and you can create net export so example uh, examples like these would also be uh, workable you can take the log values, you can take the first difference, you can divide the variable by appropriate measure. For example, uh, real rate is equal to nominal rate divided by inflation. So you need to apply some trans transformation techniques in order to make it multicollinearity free. Uh, if you are using time series data or cross-sectional data, you can combine them to make it panel data. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, uh, techniques that you can apply uh, in case if you found some multicollinearity issue in your data. Uh, you, you, there are a number of procedures that you can apply with this data. So the next assumption is outlier assumption. That is the fifth assumption here. Fifth assumption, outlier assumption. So what is, what is uh, this assumption? What is outlier? An outlier is an observation or data point that deviates significantly from the rest of the data in a data set. If you see here, uh, there are some data points which are following some direction, but there are two points which are away from this 
direction. So these data points are basically the outliers because they are they deviate from the other data points. So in other words, an outlier is an observation that lies abnormally far away from the other value in data set. Outlier can be problematic because they can affect the result of an analysis. So what is the assumption? The assumption is that there should be there should there should not be a significant outlier in the variable of interest or data set. So there are how many uh, are methods here? There are a number of methods. For example, frequency method, frequency distribution of a particular variable by selecting minimum and maximum. If you find an unusual number, it may be an outlier. Uh, the second one is explore method. You can go to analyze, descriptive, explore, put your variable of interest in DV list and click on the statistic and check box for outlier. It will show you dots in below or above box plots with the number of observation having outliers for the variable. The third method is Z standardized Z method. Uh, you, you need to go to analyze, descriptive, descriptive, put your variable of interest in the relevant box and check the safe standardized value as a variable and press OK. Now go to the last column of your data view variable. If uh, it is showing the Z value of your variable, just right click and sort descending. If you find any value greater than 3.3 or minus 3.3, it is an outlier that need to be corrected. So let's, let's uh, uh, consider these three methods that we have discussed. The first one is frequency method. In order to check the outliers using frequency, what we need to do, we, we, we consider frequency distribution of a particular variable by selecting minimum and maximum and usual. And if you found any uh, unusual number, that is basically the outlier. So let me apply this procedure. We go to we go to analyze, go to descriptive, and from here we need to check the frequency. Let's suppose my dependent variable is total marks. Uh, go to statistic. From here, you need to check minimum, maximum. Uh, and you need to check the mean also. Click continue and click OK. You will find a lot of numbers here. The mean value is 100.57, minimum is 51, maximum is 124. And you can find the frequency of a lot of numbers here. There is no seems to be any number which is unusual in this list. The highest number is 124 and the minimum number is 51 here. So I need to check another method if I cannot verify here. The another method is explore method. If we cannot identify any number which is unusual, we go to explore method. And uh, from here, we go to analyze, go to descriptive, explore. I need to put my variable of interest in the DV list where I want to find out whether there is an outlier. I need to put some of the variable of interest as a DV. So let me put the total as a DV. After doing it, what I need to do, click on the statistic and check box for outline. So I go to statistics. I check the box of outlier, click continue. Then after doing it, it will show you dots in below or above the box plot. So let me run this procedure. So yes. Now, if you see here, there are some numbers. Uh, these are the outlier, but this these are not the significant outliers. If you see any number uh, below or above 
this box plot, these are the outlier. But if you see a steric sign here, uh, then this is significant outlier because the assumption is that there should be no significant outlier. If you see assumption, there should be no significant outlier. There is an outlier in our data, but this outlier